You know what? There is an evil laugh 48 seconds into Billy Ocean's Caribbean Queen. There is. It's a sample from Michael Jackson's Thriller. I'm only bringing it up because I heard it at the bar that I work at this weekend and everybody told me I was crazy, that I was suffering from some kind of alcohol psychosis and that maybe I shouldn't be listening to it. But joke's on you, motherfuckers. <laughs> It's there. I looked it up. I'm, I have a long year and a half of researching songs. And if you're laughing at me because I say that there's an evil laugh at the beginning of Caribbean Queen, you can just eat shit because it, it's, it's absolutely there. It's 100% there. And it's straight off of Michael Jackson's Thriller. It's a big. <laughs> she thinks I'm a tiger to be tamed. <laughs> it's there. I'm not crazy. Okay, first let's back up. You're very upset about this. I came under a lot of fire. I was I was openly mocked by a by a group of people who were sitting around the bar when I said, "Did anybody else just hear that evil laugh?" Okay, like, no. that's what I was going to ask. Is this like a, a an urban legend that you had heard, or did you hear it yourself? No, I heard it. Oh. It was playing in the bar that I work at, and I asked everybody around here, "Did you just hear that evil laugh?" There's an evil laugh deep in the mix of this, and they're just like, "No, you're nuts. Like, you're absolutely crazy. You've lost your mind. Lay off the booze. What kind of drugs are you on? You need to take a break, Ben." Well, Ben, I support you and I believe you. Listen and I haven't up. even heard it, but I'm going to listen. It's there. Go find it. Why would they put an evil laugh in Caribbean Queen? <laughs> is she like, is it voodoo related? Kind of. Oh, okay. Kind well, of. that makes sense. Billy Ocean is uh, is himself from Trinidad, mm -hmm. I think. So yeah, it could very well be that there's just some some evil voodoo in there. But I felt vindicated. Well, And a vindicated me is not a good thing. <laughs> hey. <laughs> that guy yeah i don't mind being being all bravado about it you're just back from nashville tennessee i am i am so hold on hold on here we go look who went to graceland <laughs> <laughs> you took the whole family to graceland i did i did man we did we did all of tennessee we didn't mm. just do graceland we were in memphis for less than 24 hours wow we flew into memphis um we did uh we did that big stupid pyramid for some reason mm -hmm. first thing we did was a tour of sun studio mm -hmm. and i met a guy named jeff smith and jeff smith gives the tour of sun studio when you mm -hmm. pay for a tour and he has agreed to do our podcast yeah in the future mm -hmm. um so yeah we'll do like you know the history of sun studio mm -hmm. um given the proper way by the guy who does yeah. the actual tour and, you know, kind of the big names that went through there. We haven't scheduled, nailed down a date yet, but it's coming. Mm. That's um, going to be fantastic. That's going to be great. That episode. So of course we did Graceland mm. and my husband went all out and we did the VIP tour where you get to put on these white gloves and like hold an item that belonged to Elvis. No. So we got to hold the keys to his pink Cadillac. What? <laughs> <Which> is, <laughs> I'll post pictures. Super cool. <laughs> Uh, I'll rush through it real quick. Then we went to Nashville and we did all of the Nashville things. And um, the biggest things we did in Nashville, let's see, I made a list so I don't forget. Uh, we did the Johnny Cash Museum. Uh, we actually did it the same day we did Graceland. Mm -hmm. We left Graceland, drove three and a half hours to uh, Nashville and did the Johnny Cash Museum the same day because I'm insane and I push and yeah. I push <laughs> and I make people do what I have the energy to do. Um, we did the Country Music Hall of Fame, which Corbin said is just guitar porn. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just the best guitars in history. Um, and then, so I had bought tickets two months in advance to go to the Grand Ole Opry. I knew this, we could fit it in this one night no idea what the lineup was going to be and they don't really release it until a week before but they started dropping like some names like i knew we were going to see comedian henry cho who was very mm -hmm. funny and um so i forgot to even look it up but so the night before i went and looked at the lineup and i was like oh my god my mom is gonna shit her pants <laughs> they added a headliner at the last minute and um so i told my mom i was like i'm not gonna tell you who it is i want you to be surprised so we get there we have really great seats we're sitting in the pew and um my mom's like okay okay who is it and you know this is i'm showing the um the playbill and you can see the picture of the person at the bottom, but it looks like an advertisement. Yeah. And so my mom just completely ignores this picture. And she's like, okay, John Conley, Jake Hoot, Jenny Seeley, Lauren Elena, Henry Cho, Rhonda Vincent, Don Schlitt, Carrie Underwood. <laughs> and she just gives me the most authentic shocked face I've ever seen her make. And she just looked at it again. Like she just thought she was reading it wrong. Like Carrie Underwood, I'm going to see Carrie Underwood. I was like, yes. And so it was great. It was a great surprise. Um, 
And then, you know, that's kind of how we closed out Nashville. And then we went to Pigeon Forge, Gatlinburg, Dollywood. The whole back part of the trip was- went to Dollywood. Dude, let me just say, having grown up in Houston, going to hot, flat-ass Astroworld, Mm -hmm. Dollywood's got it beat. Really? It's got it beat. It's gorgeous. You can be right next to, you can be in the parking lot of Dollywood and not see it. Really? Because it's just undulating hills and mountains. It's nestled into the mountains. Mm -hmm. And so it's not hot, like everywhere is like cool and shaded and um, everything is pristine. There's flowers everywhere. I mean, I was just like, I do this three days in a row. Mm-hmm. I fucking love Dollywood. <laughs> I love the idea of, of Dolly herself, like behind the scenes, just, just cracking the whip. Like, just being <laughs> like, like, like sweet, sincere Dolly and then public facing <laughs> and then behind the scenes, just giving it to the guy who makes the cotton candy. <laughs> <laughs> These flowers are dead. We don't have dead fucking flowers in Dollywood. Hi, sugar. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> or just like, the, I forget what movie it was, but like there was a, this woman, like a Dolly Parton type was running like a brothel. And she was like talking to me, like, I appreciate what you're doing with this natural look, but we do big here. We do big hair, bright red lips. All right. Get with the program. Get them flat duties out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I just run the roller coaster. <laughs> big boobs, red lips on the roller coaster. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> all right we should probably get to it we should i'm glad that, that your that your tennessee trip kind of landed there's a, lo- a lot of uh of uh of, of serendipitousness here really we're going to be talking nashville today yes, let's yes. bring in our guest we're bringing in our guest the country comedian houston native he's a uh comedian for 17 years he's one of the producers of the whiskey brothers uh shows and podcasts he's jerry wayne longmire jerry wayne thank you for joining us uh, good to see y'all man <laughs> <laughs> have you ever been to graceland Oh, are you? Yeah, that's Mecca. <laughs> you, 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 my daughter was two. I drove. I used to play a club in Jackson, Tennessee, called uh, South Street Comedy Club, and uh, it, it's funny enough. The owner turned out to be my cousin, and we didn't find out until like years <laughs> after I was such playing. Such a country club, story already. Right? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And uh, so we drug Aubrey. When Aubrey was like two years old, we drug her to Graceland. And I've got her in the stroller and I'm telling her what everything is. And Rachel's looking at me like, what are you doing? Like, you don't understand. This shit's important. Yeah. You know, I don't care about math and all that other crap. Let's, let's yeah. knock it down. My daughter in the water, she's going to swim in. <laughs> yeah. I've not been to Dollywood. I'm jealous of that because I'm a huge Dolly Parton fan. My, my mother loved her. So I, I just, I grew up with that. Mm. isn't it gorgeous and quaint and uh, yeah, everything i uh i particularly boy i, I kind of studied on moving to nashville for a minute just to like you know like man this might be a cool place to land for a little while and uh then i spent like two weeks there and i was like ah okay let's we'll mosey um, on back to houston yeah. high I'll murder just... rate high murder rate oh in nashville <laughs> really yeah antioch's a dangerous place man wow um I'll just say this one last thing about uh, Nashville and or just Tennessee in general. They don't have the humidity that we have here. Mm -hmm. Uh, The night before we flew home, I just fell asleep with my hair wet and then went to the airport the next day. And if I had done that in Houston, I would have looked like I'd been electrocuted. (laughs) This random guy at the airport was like, your hair is beautiful. And I walked over to Corbin sitting by our gate and I was like, guess what? We're moving to Nashville. <laughs> Where my hair is gorgeous. Are you fucking kidding me? I didn't do anything. Yeah. So yeah. do you think the murder rate is high in Nashville because of like like jealous songwriters <laughs> or songwriters no, it's, like looking it's, for inspiration? It, it, it's meth. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just to clarify. <laughs> Straight up the meth and heroin trade. Can it be both? <laughs> <laughs> it usually involves one or the other <laughs> yeah you can't write a good country song if you've never beaten a man to death with your own bare hands like, i, I have said that for years i do not buy the current state of country music it's horseshit i just uh it's just it's just so laughable it's not yeah. i can't when i when i see these guys in their polished outfit and their overproduced music and they're talking about sitting on a back road with her on a tailgate. And I'm just like, what? what? That's, you know, I used to tell this story. Johnny Paycheck got caught driving west down the eastbound side of I-10 in Houston, Texas, in a rented car with two pounds of cocaine in the back seat. That's a man who <laughs> sing you a song about a shitty day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, we have a lot in common here. And th- I'm excited to, since you're just saying you don't like the current state of it, but you picked 
a guy who's in the current state of country music and why he's different than the rest. So um, we should just say today we are doing Sturgill Simpson and tell us why you picked this song, Best Clockmaker on Mars. Uh, well, I'll tell you this. I heard Sturgill Simpson years ago. He did a cover of the 80s song, Promise. Mm -hmm. And the first time I heard it, I was like, what, what the fuck is happening? You know what I mean? Like it, it jarred me so. I'm sorry when I'm thinking of right words to say. I know they don't sound the way I plan them to be. And uh, I got into the dude. He's neo traditional and he kind of does his own thing. And then he put this album out. And when this album came out, I think it's called Sound and Fury. I was addicted to it. I, I drove around listening to this album. It, it's very rare I listen to an album front to back, you know, just bam, bam, bam. I don't want to skip anything. I drove around and listened to this album for months, but this best clock, the best clock maker on Mars is like, uh, if, if you're like, I've been, you know, Rachel and I have been married 13 years and it's a pretty sacred relationship and it's a sacred covenant. We have children and, uh, we work hard to always make it work and make it work good. And it, it's it kind of like we moved back to Houston. And a lot of the reason was so I could go back pursuing comedy full time. And it's like, but it, it doesn't, I don't have to do anything like that to impress her. All I have to get up every day is be the best clock maker on Mars. Whatever the fuck I'm doing, I just have to get up every day. And I love the lyric. The lyrics that is like, it's just a really powerful love song for people who have been together for a long time want to make babies till you say we're through which she already did a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> to be clear on that <laughs> all right well right. let before you start ruining all the lyrics oh, sorry, 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 it, sorry. um no you're fine uh but i will say i don't think you realize this the last episode we recorded like we had a rerun of henry phillips last week because i was in tennessee but the last episode we recorded was the promise by when in rome with josh sneed <laughs> yeah i saw that i love josh sneed he's one of my favorite comics on the, his dry bar special is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life. Live in the desert, dessert. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, we talk about serendipity. I mean, the way these, like, you know, we didn't plan that. It just happened this way. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, what's going to happen with our next episode? Anyway, okay. So let's do it. Let's go line by line and get into the lyrics of uh, Best Clockmaker on Mars. Best Clockmaker on Mars by Sturgill Simpson. <laughs> Want to grow old in the mountain view. Want to make what? babies till you say you're through. Is that what you got? What do you have, Jerry? Mm -hmm. I want to grow old and die with you. Wow. I have want to grow old in the now with you. The internet does not know what Whoa. this guy is saying. <laughs> <laughs> want, yeah, no, I have, I have want to grow old in the, in the mountain view. Wow. Wanna I'm going to have to listen again. I like want to grow old in the now with you because I think that's that kind of go. I mean, once we get through the, the rest. Yeah, that's a little more poetic and probably a little more along the lines of his writing skill. Yeah. Than and a anything little more like your Ben come up with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I well, often miss hearing lyrics. I'm the world's you. worst about. I have been sending songs wrong my whole life. Yeah, nice. There's right. no shame in it. All right, want to grow old in the now with you? Want to make babies till you say we're through? Warm, bare, and naked when you pull me through. Turn off all the TVs. There ain't nothing new. All right. I had never That's real I, shit I, right there. <laughs> I hadn't heard this song. I, I, I read the lyrics before I actually heard the song. I'd never, I hadn't heard this song until a couple of days ago when I yeah. started doing the, uh, the research on it. So when I read that first verse, like I thought this was going to be like, like country fair. You Kenny know? Chesney, like, yeah. wanna grow old in the now with you. <laughs> it doesn't sound like that at all. There's a really snarling guitar riff that goes through this whole song. Like it's, it's yeah. really psychedelic, very, very heavy. It doesn't surprise me at all that there's different versions of, of lyrics floating around out there because the, the mix is so garbled. Like it's yeah. so bare. I, I really had to like crane my ear to try and hear like, okay, what part of the song is this that, that we're in? So it's not typical country at all. No. Like the lyrics of that first verse may feel that way to me, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely not the case. Jerry, you think? Yeah, man, it's raw. It's as raw as you want to get. It's, yeah. it's raw, nasty, big snarling guitar. 
mm-hmm. he uh when he wrote this album he had to have a bunch of den- a bunch of face surgery and he's terrified of opiates like most intelligent people from Kentucky are because it hasn't gone well for their people. <laughs> and so he locked himself in a room with like a shit ton of high powered edibles for about a month listening to Eminem, ZZ Top, The Cars. And you listen to the album, you hear it. It's all there. Yeah, It's, yeah. it's all your favorite music just being ripped on, you know. That's really cool. I like that origin story of how <laughs> He, cause we're going to talk a lot when we're done with these lyrics, we're going to talk a lot about his style and I have a lot to say about it. I'm, I'm really happy that you brought this guy to us. That's also absolutely how I want to spend my next vacation. How about we just spend a week in the extended stay America eating edibles, <laughs> listening to albums, not doing anything. I, I wish you could write a comedy album like that, but I don't think it's going to play well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think Doug Stanhope does that. <laughs> It might be like that guy with the shapes and shit, you know. Um, <laughs> the chorus of the song is going to wake up every day and be the best clockmaker on Mars, which I love that title, best clockmaker on Mars. You know, it sounds like a novel. It sounds like a, like a Tom Wolfe yeah. that everybody forgot about. But yeah. It's just... <laughs> Man. It's a brilliant way to think about it. I was trying to think, like, like what is he saying metaphorically and i landed on exactly what jerry wayne was saying earlier it's just like you're just you just have to wait it doesn't matter what you're doing you wake up every day and you go and you be the best at it and that's how you fulfill your your responsibilities but it's also kind of crazy to think about because it's i read a couple of different theories that were sort of that were online about where the best clockmaker on mars comes from and they were saying well it's kind of a useless thing to be making clocks on mars (laughs) because their time isn't done in the same way time is on earth or exactly. you get into that yeah that's what they're saying like you, you you can only you'll only be out of sync even if you are the best clockmaker on mars is what they were saying which makes Man, that's kind of brilliant i kind of love that i like it even more now oh i love all of it there was so yeah, yeah. There's a lot. i, I have my think own about that i love that idea yeah. i've always staying, felt out of sync <laughs> or staying present in the moment like like obviously like you have to do as a as a, a husband and a father like it's it's easy to to check out or there's got to be like a you know like a strong desire to just go i'm going to take some me time you know i'm not going to make the most of this three hour chunk yeah but if you're the best clock maker on mars time is very like being in the present is crazy important it's a non-stop job mm-hmm. uh yeah i had written down some Who notes you buy that- your weed from ben <laughs> I'll tell you his name off the air. He's excellent. You're love him. <laughs> Fuck. I'm, I'm getting ripped off. All right. So I'll just go into a couple of this. When I just I put like maybe 20 minutes of thought into it and I was like, all right, what does he mean by the best clockmaker on Mars? And I put is I'm asking, is it simply living with this woman forever into the future through numerous lives until we all leave Earth and just exist on Mars? It could very well be that it also could be like like you're when you're raising a child with somebody like there's no more accurate way of marking the time do you know what i mean yeah like a year to you and corbin means a hell of a lot more than it does to me because it's a year of your like you're not in grade one anymore he's in grade two yeah you know he's, he's, God, you're your not teeth. he's moved on to this sort of thing uh, i don't think about life that way yeah. Did you just say you live by Lord, you're not getting it? when you live by developmental life cycles as opposed to a calendar yeah. it's a Mm-hmm. it's insane with a kid like people who don't have kids get frustrated when you're like my kid's 18 months old and they're like why are you doing that why are you going by month and i'm like because there is a huge difference in 13 months and 18 months on what the kid can do right like it's insane and so other parents get it but mm. kids people don't have kids are like this is dumb why are you doing this <laughs> how long are you going to keep doing it yeah exactly <laughs> God, I wonder if my mom could do that. Like, how many months alive am I? What's 40? Oh, you yeah, stop after like two because yeah. the developmental <laughs> yeah, yeah. milestones are kind of a little different. I mean, but there's, if your child's not walking at 15 months and they did start walking at nine months, that's a, there's a big deal. Most kids don't walk at nine months. Yeah. Charlie did. And then, but if they're at 15 months and not walking, you have to start being like, uh, like what's going on here? Is this, is this something we need, you know, physical therapy? I mean, that's just how it breaks down. And this is how I think about time on mars like mm. you have to stay focused on it mm. i want you to keep charlie's brain. Every, everybody tells you the one thing i heard a lot and i'm sure you did too diane is before you have kids like it goes fast it goes fast everybody just repeats that over and over and you're like okay i'll get it jack it, it goes fast and then you like leave for work one day and you come home and your kid's heavier yeah <laughs> <And you're> like, <laughs> what the hell 
<laughs> yeah, and you're like, why don't any of Or you look up one day and you're 44 and you got an 11 year old. It's, <laughs> it's like, it's baffling. Yeah, it's, it's, it, time gets twisted with children. It really, mm. really does. Um, okay, next lyrics. Let's keep going. <laughs> All right. Uh, some days I hate everything I am, but your love holds a mirror to me, which is so true and so incredibly painful. Like for anybody who like struggles with self-doubt or any kind of like level of self-hatred, like once you're getting into a, as a relationship, like as it gets deeper and they start finding out the ugly feelings that you have about yourself. Yeah. It's nasty. Oh, yeah. oh Bill October had a great so song about that called Ugly Side. It's just that, <laughs> it's that reality. If you're self-aware at all, you realize you're an ugly little creature inside. Yeah. And right. uh, when you find that person that loves you, no matter what kind of ugly little creature you, they've seen your ugly e come out, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. they've seen the sad mopey guy they've seen the snarly hillbilly they, mm-hmm. and they're still okay with it it's yeah. we were kind of having this conversation in some other episode weeks ago but it's like there's a there's a moment where you're, where you're in that that moment of relationship where you're three or four or five years in yeah where it's like it's like the incurable me meets the incurable you yeah you're like all of the bad things that i really can't change and all the bad things that you really can't change now they have to like go on a first date yeah and that's, <laughs> that, when that's a really... great way to put that that's yeah incredible. i mean that's I when that. you realize if it's worth it yeah you know like am i worth putting up with your bad forever mm-hmm. yeah. and vice versa and i that's why i don't think people should get married after they're together like three or four <laughs> three <laughs> or five years because i recommend at least one or two <laughs> <laughs> learn it yeah. go live with each other learn how to live with each other yeah, we mm-hmm. bury those bads for a while until you just can't anymore. They right. can't stay buried forever. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, all right, can you live with this? Mm-hmm. Can you? Well, it's like, this? you know, you you grow up living with your family. Most people, you know, mm-hmm. you know, unless you're an orphan or whatever, I don't want to exclude anybody. But you grow up living with your family and you live with them, you know, anywhere from 15 to 18 years. And you still don't get along all the time and you still fuss and fight. And then people get married and they move in together after a year of dating and they're well, this is just, just isn't working. Like you don't even know if it's working yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it all comes down to, is this person willing, am I willing to try for this person? Yeah. There's some people you're like, yeah. I'm not willing to try. Mm-hmm. And then some people you're like, yeah, yeah, you're worth it. Yeah. yeah. It's the old love is an, is an active verb. It's many yeah. things, including a decision. Yeah. yeah. It is decide, like, very much a choice every morning yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to stay focused on this marriage. Mm-hmm. And, um, make it make the choice to be happy Mm -hmm. make the choice to let some shit go that bothers you be like is it worth arguing about it's not let it go just wake up in the morning and be the best you'll find a lot of shit ain't worth arguing about it's not Mm. (laughs) it's uh uh, you when you when you find especially when you go through hard times ago you know loss of parents stuff like that and you realize like i am not gonna find another ally like this like something happens to rachel i'm just gonna hole up in a fucking cave somewhere (laughs) <laughs> you know <laughs> kids are fucked i don't know what yeah. they're gonna do. <laughs> corbin said he knew he was ready to marry me after hurricane ike and we had to live together for 12 straight days without um power and it was hot it was mm-hmm. august in houston uh eight straight day no 12 straight days without power and his friend and his friend's dog came so we had three dogs we didn't fight once we had y'all did the y'all did the same thing we so Rachel and I got married September 6th in Vegas with our friend Venetian, flew home to get ready to go on our honeymoon, Hurricane Ike hit, and we holed up in a ho- in our house in Oak Forest, me, her, my brother, his roommate, and two dogs, and same thing, 15, 16 days, no power, honeymoon with Jack Daniels and Monopoly. <laughs> oh my god ours was candlelight and risk <laughs> we had a great time and risk felt so real and in, in the dark with candles <laughs> like we had like our game of thrones like war yeah. like laid out on the table Hell yeah we had a great time and i think that's when corbin's like all right i can do this with her also i can help you lift a couch up a crooked stairway without complaining yeah i'm a i'm a sturdy woman <laughs> <laughs> She's on the couch and she's got plans for world domination. I'm in. Go get a ring. I'm really good at risk. <laughs> <laughs> you don't be piling all the armies on top of Madagascar. You've got a plan. I got I got plans, dude. <laughs> all right. Uh, but your love holds a mirror to me. Show me a love I can understand, make sense of the world I see. Mm-hmm. 
it's just nice. Mm -hmm. These are just nice things that, you want your husband to say about you. <laughs> that 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 sticks with me because when Rach and I met, I was very much a conservative. Uh, I don't know what you want to call it. Red, I just very redneck. Just very. Uh, I, I grew up with some very poor teachings and some very poor programming, and she has been patient with me for many years as I've learned and developed and tried to become a better person. And she was like my guide, my kind of like my Zen teacher on that shit, you know, bringing me into the 21st century. And you know, hey, these people that raised you were crazy. Don't listen to them. You know that kind of stuff. You know. <laughs> Uh, so that shit sticks with me about that. Like I, I think about that, like the person I am now, as opposed to the person I was when I met her. And it's, it's because she helped me. She helped me learn to see the world the way that it meant. Yeah. Isn't that nice mm -hmm. when that happens, you get a perspective that you actually don't want to argue with anymore, even though it differed from your own. Oh yeah. Yeah. Not, not to say we don't still argue about shit, but yeah, <laughs> I'm usually wrong. Turns out. <laughs> that works for marriage. But you let her show you the world in her eyes. No. Somebody should write that down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, want to grow old in the now with you. Want to make babies till you say you're through. Warm, bare, naked when you pull me through. I really like that 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 couplet there. I want to talk about earlier. Want to make babies till you say you're through. Because it seems like he's being very realistic about it. Like, I guess there's two ways you can take it. Like, you want to make babies? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think he's being realistic about it. Like, like, I don't have kids myself, but it's just like, okay, well, there's the act of making a baby. And then there's the act of having a baby. And then there's the lifelong journey of, of you're still making that baby. Yes. You know, even though you're off the hospital bed or the wedding bed. Yes. Like, that's, that's an ongoing thing. And I think that's what that, when this song talks about the passage of time, it reminds me of that rhyming couplet where you're <laughs> not done making a baby. Right. <laughs> After just birth. Yeah. 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 Are you ever done? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think our goal is, you know, make the baby and raise the baby till they're 18 and then they're off on their own. But like, you know, I'm still, you know, I rely on my mom and stuff. So you're sure. always kind I take of a, I take a very, uh, I, I read a book about Sam Kennison one time and I really, I really loved his approach to this, but he had a bit about it too. He's like, you know, you wrote the check to fucking get me here. I was this cosmic being floating around in space, enjoying nothingness, having a great time. And you wanted to get laid and now I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> you wrote the check, pay the check. Yes. <laughs> and, and I sort of, I really have that approach to my children is like, I don't care if you're 40 and you need a place to land. Daddy's here. Come on back, you know. Yeah. You None always got a safety net. Mm. Yeah. I hope mine never move out. Yeah. <laughs> you say yeah. that now. I always tell my friends, like, like, like they always joke about, okay, you're done. It's 18 years, and as soon as they're 18, they're on. The, you're on your own. I'm like, I think I caused my parents the most worry <laughs> and harm, certainly like financially and stressfully, probably between 20 and 30. <laughs> <laughs> well, my ours our family went to their Gigi's house for about four days and they called on the fourth day and asked if they could stay another day and we had already spent four days playing video games and talking about them and we were like oh, what <laughs> we, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> i don't know man i know not everybody feels that way but you know it's uh we also homeschool so when they're with you all the time all the time you know it kind of gets it, it's a little creepy when they're not around <laughs> well, but it's also a lot. I have a kid who's ADHD quit napping when he was two and he's a lot. And I'm to me, I'm like, as long as he's taken care of by someone he loves, I'll take the break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Understandable. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, I mean, that's basically the end of the lyrics. There's mm -hmm. not a lot to it. Uh, he says what he needs to say in a couple of verses and uh, just keep saying, gonna wake, it home. yeah, yep. going to wake up every day and be the best clockmaker on Mars. Mm -hmm. I really like how how the, the the verses seem like they're very very straightforward. They're not particularly poetic. They're just straight up love and devotion. But the the title of the song is just absolutely like it just it just sends it into literally into outer space. It's very like, David Bowie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. yes. I love Bowie, and I, I, I like the way he's just kind of yelling it at you. It's yeah. a it's a love profession. It's the way you feel when you talk about your person. You want to yell it from the rooftops. It's just. Give me that snarling guitar and let me yell how much I love you. Yeah. Yeah. Hope it doesn't scare you. Yeah. <laughs> don't rec don't recommend it two months in, but you know. <laughs> you know what's so funny is he takes like this very, it could be just like a slow love song lyric and fucking rocks it. But then he'll take 
songs like in bloom by nirvana or when in rome's the promise mm. and bring it down to like a yeah, slow country man. song i love that in bloom cover yeah i don't even like in bloom the original song but i love <laughs> the way he does it yeah it yeah you're like i didn't know you could make that a country song and it sounds legit it sounds like it could have always been a country song from this 1970s i'm petitioning for him to take on pat benatar's we belong like come on let that be the next one yeah that would be a good one everyone that loves good that 80s song. drum break mm -hmm. yes. yeah we've covered it that was josh one of josh need's favorite songs i mean i think universally I bet we could put money at universally. No one hates we belong. <laughs> I would think that's true. Yeah, there might be people who don't like it, but I doubt that there's anybody who's just ah. Oh, this song. Probably just like yeah. Pat Benatar's producer. You know, <laughs> <laughs> somebody's heard it eighty-seven times. One of her fucking roadies. He's like, yeah. fuck that goddamn turn it shit off. Right. <laughs> I was amazed at how wrong I had Sturgill Simpson in my head. Let's talk about it. My, he does not look like that voice. No, he no. doesn't. <laughs> but the, like the, the first time I heard of him was, was that cover of, of When in Rome. There was a bar that I worked at that that song was on one of the, it was on the jukebox and people would play it all the time. So I didn't know a whole lot about country music. And I still don't. But for some reason, like in my head, I just figured that Sturgill Simpson was probably like, like, like David Allen Coe or Steve Earle, kind of like, like that generation of, of country, you know, just like, you know, just like, 10 or 15 years after yeah. after William and Merle, you know, had the had the big days. But I, I always thought of Sturgill Simpson as, oh, he's got to be in his 60s. That name alone. Sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, and a name like Sturgill Simpson sounds like he's been around forever. Mm. You know, I, I really thought I was going to be reading about a guy who's been a country music legend since the since the early to mid 70s. And he's not. He's real new. Can he I was just in the say... Navy during the I, during the Gulf War? Yeah, he, he's younger so he, than me. He's, he's not <laughs> yes. is, he, is he younger than you? Barely. Yep. I was born too. in 77. Like he was born in 78. So. Oh, that's horseshit. Okay. <laughs> I have not said, done enough of my life. <laughs> when you said Sturgill Simpson, I knew I knew nothing about this guy. So just the name hit me and my visual was an old black dude. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can just imagine, Dad, what kind of hillbilly shit the jury just <laughs> <laughs> Well, what's funny is I like This is Rock the Cash shit. Bar, not the hillbilly opera album. <laughs> Well, so people like they get confused by me because they know me as like my favorite band is Depeche Mode and I love New Wave. But I was like, but you don't understand. I love classic country like that. It's a nostalgia thing. I grew up in like, you know, in our trailer when I was little and uh, my mom would put on records of like Conway Twitty and the Judds and mm -hmm. then like older Patsy Cline and uh, oh God, Loretta Lynn. I mean, I'm just a huge fan of classic country. And so I was like, no, I'm down, Jerry. I just don't know who this is. <laughs> <laughs> um, so his style, let's talk about his style. And I'm just going to read here. Simpson is often compared to Waylon Jennings and his style to the outlaw country genre of country music. Waylon Jennings' son, Shooter Jennings, says Sturgill isn't imitating at all. And he sounds like my favorite era of my dad, the 70s where he would sing quieter and more conversational. That's what struck me about Sturgill from day one, and it still does. Um, Simpson himself counts Merle Haggard, Willie Nelson, Keith Whitley, and Marty Robbins as much bigger influences on his sound than Waylon Jennings. But I like this. His overall sound was described by IndieWire as a mesmerizing and sometimes bewildering mix of traditional country sound, contemporary philosophy, and psychedelic recording studio wizardry. Yep. <laughs> yeah, he, he's an amazing, like, that's one of the things about him. He's an amazing producer. And he, yeah, I've read several interviews. The Rolling Stone interview is one of the best. Yeah. where he discussed he's like if i had my druthers i would spend most of my time in the studio just making music and he's brought along this nice little i was really disappointed with country music and now there's this i, I hate to give it a name but they can they kind of call it neo-traditional uh bluegrass and it's these guys you know i, I come from appalachian people and it's it's that sound it's these guys that are coming out of uh they're coming out of kentucky and they're coming out of north tennessee and they, they grew up with coal miner families and pill addicted families. And they're singing about real things. Uh, there's uh, Benjamin Thomas and Tyler Childers is another one I really love. And he's producing him now. And he's really brought that crop out. And they're doing some things. I, I told somebody the other day, neo-traditional bluegrass music is proof that if you throw in enough poverty and mass addiction, you're going to get some good music. That's, <laughs> it. That's all you need. That's how we got hip hop. That's how we got punk. Yes, exactly. Like, I don't want to hear. Oh, sorry. Did he freeze? 
Oh shit! Don't freeze! Don't freeze! There you go. All right. Sorry about that, guys. They're working on something here at the apartment. It keeps throwing my damn internet out. No All right. No worries. I like what where you were going though. I like what you were saying. My biggest thing about it, music that's not true to its genre. Like I am the biggest. I fucking hate Blink 182. Okay. I'm going to scream it from the rooftops. That's not punk music. It's not, it's, it's a boy band that went to, um, what's the damn store in the mall? Hot yeah. topic. Hot topic. Hot topic. <laughs> it's, yeah. there's nothing about their music that's punk and it, it makes it, me curious. So music that's true to its roots is good always. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not even good mall punk. It's, uh, <laughs> We need to make a list of good mall punk bands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Ataris. That's it. <laughs> Maybe good Charlotte. <laughs> no, I like the, the idea that, that all you need is poverty and drug addiction to create great art. Because I think that's what mm-hmm. you, like, not necessarily those specific things, but you need struggle, like, a sp- particularly for music. Like, it has to be because you have to you have to have that true emotion at the center of it right yeah but then you also have to have the what are we going to do to pass the time right like what are we going to do the like the lights are out and we're hungry like like you have to break out the guitar it's the only way to get it's the only way to get to proper good music i think it's probably necessary for most great art yeah you know i mean it's unfortunate for the people it happens to but i fucking love music so i know (laughs) and i will say on the flip side I have said many times on this podcast, I like yacht rock, and you can't be poor and make yacht rock. <laughs> <laughs> right there in the title. <laughs> you have to come from a wealthy family in the burbs to write <laughs> sailing takes me away. Yeah. <laughs> or ugly. And that's what helped him. He was trying to get laid. You write the good ass <laughs> music when you're trying to get some work i miss when bands were a lot just allowed to be ugly we had it really good in the 70s and then like then it just became like if you're ugly i don't care how talented you are Mm -hmm. you cannot do this job oh i miss when comics were allowed to be it was great (laughs) i think if you're pretty and funny fuck you it's weird right (laughs) you're that matthew broussard fuck you It's weird when you, fuck you, when you see someone that's extremely good looking and extremely funny, you're like, what? Well, how? I hate your guts. I just hate your guts. I hate them. But then if you're big, <laughs> a lot of times you're like, oh, you were molested. Okay, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> good, good. There's something wrong with you. You're okay yeah, now. <laughs> we get it now. You're, you're allowed to talk to us again. <laughs> um, all right. So I wanted to talk a little bit about fusion because we've mm-hmm. been talking about this a lot. Like, um. It seems like it's a very millennial thing, this fusion. Like they're doing it with food. And uh, I wrote down Sturgill is a chicken wonton taco and I am here for it. <laughs> I will listen to his Mexican ravioli falafel cob salad all day. <laughs> Kierkegaard once said, to label me is to negate me. And it, you know, it's one of my favorite quotes. And I just feel like people are, we're getting out of like these old days where people feel comfortable compartmentalize. Like everything is black and white. Like you listen to country, I listen to rap. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, it's such a disservice to being a human to put us in these categories. Um, if you can meld them mm-hmm. and it's good the way Sturgill Simpson is doing it, it's beautiful. Right. You know, mm. there's also a lot of bad. There there's is a Florida, lot of bad. So ben Florida, Georgia line. This. I'll give you that. There's, <laughs> there's, sometimes it doesn't work. But I am there for a lot of the Southern country. There's a guy out of Nashville named Jelly Roll. I love to hear this guy rap. And uh, it's just, you, you hear the voice and it throws you a little bit, but the guy's incredible. You know, it's, uh, I, I enjoy that. I'm with you on it. But there yeah. is a lot of bad. So, yeah, we broke this down before we started. And we have a theory of when it's bad. But I do love the Willie Nelson Snoop Dogg that roll me up and smoke me when I oh, die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So fucking good. Um, so we realize when it's bad is when it's pop. When country yeah. tries to be pop, it's bad. Mm-hmm. Um, when country mm-hmm. tries to be pop, when rap tries to be pop, when when Blink One Eighty True tries to make punk pop, it always goes poorly. You're okay. you're right. The more commercial, the more they try to follow the commercial formula yep. for mm-hmm. what sells albums, and and they do sell, but it just ah, it just doesn't do it for me. It's it got doesn't no soul. feel it's got no genuine. It, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's no. not genuine, and um, it's because it's, it's a weird place to, to start because pop is obviously marketed to to people like fourteen years old and even younger. Mm-hmm. You know, like there's plenty of artists out there that I don't like and don't listen to because they're not for me that are specifically marketed to 12 year olds right so if you tried to take like that kind of pop music and then put it into bluegrass or put it into like like some serious emotional 
cement mixer it's never going to work out that well you know i it's like i tried to be a pretty uh, i hate the word woke but woke modern dad That's and right. like i want to i want to be there for whatever you know whatever happens to my kids mm-hmm. if one of them tells me they're gay or trans or whatever mm-hmm. i just won't be there for them and just be like you know I don't, you just be whatever you got be you know but and i and i thought i was like pre-prepared for shit and then my son who's eight who just turned nine or he's about to turn 10 i don't know Anyway, somewhere in there, uh, he came up and told me his favorite song was a Rascal Flat song, and I, I, I immediately turned to my father, like, "Nope, not in this goddamn house." No. <laughs> I started looking in the Bible for reasons it wasn't okay. Like right here, Ecclesiastes seven five. It's better to hear the rebuke of a wise man than the song full. Right there, Jesus said it. No Rascal, Flatt. not in my goddamn house. <laughs> I was just like, nope, nope. Uh, how my wokeness left me. Sorry. Oh, that's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's really good. We were laughing talking about the idea of trying to make a pop song country and make it good, and we were using Justin Timberlake for like, I'm bringing sexy back. <laughs> the yeah. brothers don't know how to act. <laughs> <laughs> just dripping with sincerity yeah. them other brothers don't know how to act it was, that was my johnny cash and it's I like that lmfa i got a pistol in my britches and i ain't afraid to use it <laughs> god as much as i love some old country it's the easiest to rag on mm-hmm. <laughs> well it's because like like, like I mean, all the interviews that i read about about sturgill simpson it kept coming back to authentic and it was like the the writers or the interviewer kept trying to throw that word at him just like you're the most authentic musician out there today the most authentic and even he was resistant to that because it's a weird sort of ring to be reaching for like it would take a huge big ego to go i'm the next willie nelson exactly i am your merle haggard shoes need to be filled like that's (laughs) ridiculous to think you could do that merle's day is terrible here so badly yeah (laughs) We want you to Willie, do it. Willie's son is making great music. You, really? you heard him, Lucas Nelson. He's amazing, but it sounds, it sounds exactly like Willie like playing him. as a rock. Yes, it's, it's wonderful. It's really good. Um, <laughs> we were talking about. I just wanted to say this because it was funny. Years ago, my friend, we're talking about like compartmentalizing, but my friend, uh, who was a white woman, was uh, kind of jamming some like hip hop in the house, and her son, came, or son, her husband came up behind her and whispered in her ear. He's like you're a rich white woman, um, <laughs> which was funny because, and then but we were like, but what, what are, what do rich white women, like, what are we supposed to listen to? And I was like, well, they're from North Carolina. So I'm assuming he thinks it's country, but mm. I, again, was like, it's Yacht Rock. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, me and Rachel have been laughing a lot recently. Now, so Rachel's younger than me. She's, she's my sister's age. She's five years younger than me. And she's like right on the cusp of millennial gen x mm-hmm. and i think us three are probably all pretty thoroughly yes. off of gen, you and me are the same age yeah. in gen x and uh it, it, so there's this weird thing so all our life all advertising has pretty much been directed at the baby boomers that's who had the money that, that's the diaper industry was created for them the toy industry all, all these huge massive industries were created for the baby boomers as they've aged And for the first time ever lately in commercials, for whatever reason, they're advertising the Gen X. And it's so weird. They're using an ODB song to try to sell me a fucking washer and dryer. (laughs) And uh, what's that? Uh, Oop, there it is. Ice cream and shit. And we just fall out laughing every time. Like, fuck, they're getting a sandwich, you know? (laughs) (laughs) I I didn't think there was that many of us to begin with. (laughs) I love how they're bringing back, like Corbin and I talk about all the time, how I'm sorry, every generation after the eighties, you missed out on the good movies. If you weren't a kid in the eighties, like we can just name them all like the Goonies and yeah. Labyrinth. I mean, stand by me, everything. And, um, you know, bringing back stranger things, it was just, it's all for us. They did mm-hmm. it for you us. You know, I didn't want to like that show and, uh, Rach wanted to check it out. And so we like watched the first episode and I'm not going to lie, the cheesy nostalgia it dialed me in my little atari brain lit up and started <laughs> punching numbers and i it was straight you name goonies and I, I went right oh my god this was written for me i had no idea okay i'm sorry i'll sit here and watch it yeah i mean pixar's doing great things for my son but he he don't know he doesn't know <laughs> no it does yeah the pixar movies are amazing i i submit that uh probably toy story 
that last one's probably one of the best movies I've ever seen in my life. But they just, they, you had to look for a pirate ship full of treasure. I mean, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you kids aren't having any fun. Um. All right. What else do we got? I had this whole thing where I did all this research about the process of actual timekeeping on Mars. And I don't think it fits into this conversation, but <laughs> you should look at it. You should okay. Wikipedia it. <laughs> <laughs> because it's psycho. It, it's crazy. Um, and I just, you know what? We There's all this talk about Mars. It's not for us, guys. <laughs> I, I don't think we'd be happy there. <laughs> we got to figure out how to make Earth work. Have you seen the pictures of Mars? I don't want to live there for the same reason I don't want to live in Arizona. I'm not doing it. I have such a self-centered perspective that I just assumed we'd be using our clock. (laughs) (laughs) I I remember the first time my cousins from Florida visited when I was like 13. I found out they weren't learning Texas history in middle school. I was like, what the fuck are y'all learning about? I do not know about the Alamo. (laughs) What the the hell could have happened in Florida? Yeah. Yeah. Um. All right, before we move on to the next segments, is there anything that we're not saying about Sturgill Simpson and uh, this song that you want to say? No, I, don't, I mean, I think we nailed it, you know? He wants to drive, I'll so. tell you what it is to me. It's just hard driving love profession. Love it. Yeah. It was a great tune. Thank you very much for introducing me to it. And Listen also- the rest of the album. Make friends, not art. Make art, not friends. Mm-hmm. You will... When you listen to the lyrics that, it, as, especially as a performer or whatever, it will, oh, and uh, Mercury and Retrograde, that one too, especially. I think it's great. All right, well, this time let's uh, let's do our Six Degrees of Tommy Stinson with Jeremy Essig and see how he connected Sturgill Simpson to the bassist of The Replacements. Uh, let's see. Holy shit, I've been gone for a week and I don't remember how to share my screen. Oh, here we go. (laughs) Hey friends, welcome to the first Americana edition of Six Degrees, where this week we're going to connect Tommy Stinson to one of the more interesting voices in current country music, Sturgill Simpson. After a chance meeting at a Billy Joe Shaver concert, Simpson would enlist producer Dave Cobb to work with him on his first two albums, High Top Mountain and Meta Modern Sounds in country music. Cobb would go on to fill a similar production role on a number of albums by Jason Isbell who not only is one of the best singer-songwriters in modern music, but also holds the distinction of being the third most famous person on my phone currently. Isbell would also contribute guitar to the song Mean Old World in 2019, the first single off Up and Rolling by the North Mississippi All-Stars. That band is composed of brothers Luther and Cody Dickinson, the sons of legendary producer Jim Dickinson, who lists amongst his credits production on The Replacements Please to Meet Me, which features bass and cackling from Tommy Stinson. So, Sturgill Simpson to Dave Cobb to Jason Isbell to a weird diversion to my phone to the Dickinson family to Tommy Simpson. Back to Diana Beck. Right, who, are the two, who are the people two more the- famous than Jason Isbell? <laughs> <laughs> I want to know. <laughs> that was absolutely incredible. All right. Well, mm, won't yes. be over, dude. He's very talented, right? Um, all right, Jerry, my favorite part. Uh, do you have a guilty pleasure song? Yeah, man, I got to mess up. But <laughs> probably my, my most favorite one, and uh, I'm getting ready to record a one-hour special that I've been writing for a long time, and and the, there's a feeling to it. To me, like if I had a Vegas show, this would be the song that played before I came in, but it's Brother Love, Salvation Show by Neil Dime. Yeah. <laughs> I just have that. It, it, it gives me this, it you know I grew up Pentecostal. It allows me to fulfill that gospel sort of, yep. you know, feel good kind of. You know, not everything about church was terrible. The music was wonderful, yes. and uh, yeah. it, it takes me back to that. It lets me feel that. And I'm telling you, I mean, if you see me on Allen Parkway or Montrose, and I'm just belted out the top of my lungs, just roll your windows up and go on, you know, because yeah. <laughs> I'm going all the way to the end. I love the drama of that song, like the slow build. It's like it, it's like a fuse burning down. It's starting with hot August night with the leaves yeah. hanging down. Everybody sing. <laughs> what he says, what he says, when he lifts his face, every ear in the place is on him. I'm like, yeah, yeah. that's that that's that comedy shit. That's that shit you feel right before yeah. you go on stage, you know. Yeah, and as a performer, like like obviously Neil Diamond is one of the best to ever step on stage. But like as somebody who wanted to be a performer and yeah. tried to be it, like that's the moment you're trying to recreate. Yes. Yeah. When yeah. he lifts his face, every year in the place is on him. That's really, really mm. good, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my jam, man. I uh 
it's on every playlist I got. I'm pretty basic. Did you have a second best? Um, probably my other one, and this is like a, it's my mood alterer. Uh, it doesn't matter. Like I can be having some pretty terrible days. Good vibrations by the Beach Boys. It's my, <laughs> yes. That's my oh. that's my reset my brain. Yep. <laughs> that, it, it helps me reset. I listen to Brian, and it's really if you read the original lyrics that Brian Wilson wrote, it's a really creepy, fucked up song. But <laughs> it's a uh, oh it, it just fixes me. It fixes, mm. it puts me back. Uh, I listen to a lot as a child, the Beach Boys especially, and uh, it's one of those that I I can Feel just good. I can mm. use it to change my mood when I need to. Yeah. Well, what's funny is I pointed to Ben because I thought you were talking about the Marky Mark. <laughs> 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 and that was his guilty pleasure song early on. <laughs> nice. <laughs> the video to that song is absolutely amazing. Like, like just oh, like how just it, nonsensical. It. Yeah. <laughs> they just wanted to show his abs. Got- That's all it was. <laughs> How yeah, about we get a few more shots of you Mark weights in his wet factory? <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird how these two Southie brothers from Boston have managed to include themselves in every piece of pop culture in the last 20-something years. I yeah. mean... Like, I thought when NKOTB died, that was the end of the Wahlbergs. Yeah. yeah. I thought, oh, well, we'll never see them again. Fuck, here they are everywhere. <laughs> it was uh, the beginning. And you know what? I like Marky Mark. Dirk Diggler was fucking funny. His performance in I Heart Huckabees, mm-hmm. me and Corbin talk about it all the time. He's so good in that. Um, I like my I like him in the Ted movies. He's hilarious, man. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like him because I think he doesn't realize he's funny. <laughs> you don't think he knows? You know what I mean? I think he he thinks he's trying to be serious, and he doesn't realize how funny he is. And I well, think, I think that's he, what makes him work. I think that's what he used to think, and someone told him, like, no, straight you is funny <laughs> and he's like oh well i can just do this though <laughs> yeah I, I think the same thing about ice cube i think ice cube <laughs> is hilarious because he doesn't know he is <laughs> <laughs> that's really true <laughs> all right um actually before we let you go i'll let you hang on while we do our dressed up like a douche because it uh, our dressed up like a douche for this week is from stephanie mcconaughey i had to ask her how to pronounce that um bruce springsteen song glory days the lyric is make you feel like a full boy, but she heard making love like a pool boy. <laughs> <laughs> They're good, so I've heard. There's I have a lot of those. I've I, seen a I lot of short years, films that pool boys have made. And <laughs> I thought for years that the Big Pippin song said spit in the cheese. Spit in the cheese. Big <laughs> Pippin, spit in the cheese. Spit in the cheese. Did you think that was just like some kind of um I just thought it was some understand? shit I didn't understand. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, there's a lot in rap songs I hear that I don't fully understand. But For sure. It's, it sounds nice. Yeah, as we get older, it gets worse. <laughs> like, I can yeah, hang yeah. on. Oh, yeah, yeah. The current, yeah. Oh, fuck, <laughs> man. I don't know what the hell anyone's talking about anymore. My, and then my little current to- hip hop list. I, I just use one of those Apple uh, hip hop lists when I work out, and I, I'll I'll be down in the gym working out. Like, what what the hell is he singing about? You know, like what what's happening? I'm okay, here? to just be like, I'm too old. I can't. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to do this. Well, Jerry, before we let you go, promote yourself. Where can the listeners see and hear more of you? Uh, when's this come out? uh monday i don't monday okay cool wasn't 100 percent sure uh i will be in nacogdoches texas at bonita creek dance hall headlining june 25th which is one of the probably the closest i'm going to be to east texas for a while um and then july 8th at the secret group in houston texas i'm recording my one hour special wrecking yard Congratulations! and uh we're gonna have i got a local uh a local popular musician brian bc carry and he's with strippers lie and everything he's actually making me some theme music nice Best great worker on mars <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh so uh we're gonna have a good time with that it's gonna be uh it's gonna be a little bit of a, a spectacle i got some great comics on the show i got will loden hosting and trey tutson featuring and then um I uh, fortunately I, I picked up some military contracts. So I'm going to be touring some military bases the rest of the year, yeah. doing that kind of thing. Uh, so, and you can find me on Facebook, Jerry Wayne Longmire. I'm on uh, Twitter at Comedy Jerry. 
or Instagram at Jerry Wayne Live, and I tried to provide different content on all three platforms. So, oh God, all to right. make it a somewhat interesting follow. Twitter, I just kind of use like an open mic. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. 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 I had this idea that when the year started, I was like, I'm going to write a new joke every day on Twitter. And that fell off mid-April. <laughs> <laughs> That's still a jokes long were getting to get pretty through. fucking dark by yeah. mid-April. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, this was awesome. And like, we both thank you again for introducing us to Sturgill Simpson. Like, I have a music podcast and I'm so bad about finding new music, like current music. And this like was great. It. Learning and reconnecting is the best thing about doing this podcast. Thank you so much, Jerry. Really appreciate it. Thank y'all for having me. I enjoyed it. All right. See you later, dude. See ya. Okay. All right. That was a lot of fun. I think of all of the the episodes that we've done about people that I didn't know too much about, Sturgill Simpson might be the person that I that I'd like the most. Yeah. You know, like I like I knew nothing about the guy. Every assumption that I'd made about him was wrong. Mm-hmm. And everything that I listened to was just like, oh, this is fantastic. Well, that's and, really great. Hmm. Yeah, that, that yeah, it makes me so happy when that happens. Um, all right, next week, we are covering a song suggested by a Patreon member and my father-in-law, Charlie Gallagher. And he has gone over this and over this and changed his song and then back to his song. We locked it in today. We are doing, the song is called Bruised Orange in parentheses, Chain of Sorrow by John Prine, the late, great John John Prine. Prine. Um, My husband was raised on John Prine, uh, having his father, Charlie Gallagher, um, sing those songs to him when he was a baby, like on guitar. So he's raised with them. And so when John Prine died last year of COVID, it hit, it hit Corbin and his dad really hard. Um, So another one maybe you don't know anything about that's fine yeah but uh we're we're going we're keeping with this country tennessee thing we got going for a while so Mm -hmm. uh we'll keep that going for at least one more song so we'll we'll be back here next week with some john prine oh remember if you want to have a chance for us to cover a song that you choose join our patreon for five dollars a month you'll get um some cool swag and uh your name will be the in a drawing that we draw once a month and we will absolutely draw your name eventually so we will cover a song of your choosing. Um, and please keep sending us those misheard song lyrics. They're really, really good. And make it personal. One that you personally misheard. Yeah? Yes. Yeah. Thank right. you very much for listening. And... Uh... <laughs>